All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I appreciate you joining us for today's Open SUNY Fellow Chat. My name is Erin Maney, and I am the manager of Open SUNY Communications and Community Engagement. On behalf of the Open SUNY team, I would like to welcome you to this Fellow Chat. The Open SUNY Fellow Chat series is a program that we offer with the aim of featuring Open SUNY fellows and faculty and their work to support our mission of networking, interaction, and excellence in teaching and learning. So we're excited to share this fellow chat with you today. A couple administrative things. Um, if you uh, are listening and not asking questions, we ask that your talk button is off, that you make sure that you are not having some background noise. If you have questions at any time, please put them in the chat. I'd be happy to assist you. And you can also post questions for our speaker in the chat window as well. And I'll be moderating that as we go. We will um, also have some time at the end for some questions and answer. So without further ado, we're pleased to welcome Gina Seigley from Nassau Community College today, sharing about the philosophical framework for inviting mobile phones into the classroom and offering strategies for developing an effective web enhanced class. Gina is an instructor of reading, basic education, and women's studies at Nassau. So on behalf of the Open SUNY community, Gina, thank you for joining us today and sharing your experience with us. Thank you, Erin, for inviting me. And thank you to everybody who decided to participate on what, for many of us, is still a, a winter recess between semesters. I appreciate your time and your, your interest. I'm going to begin by looking at some of the framework for why we should invite mobile phones into the classroom, and then spend some time talking about strategies and ways to possibly do that effectively with your own students, and ways that institutions may choose to scale the use of mobile phones in a classroom for maximum impact. I want to begin, though, in a place where you might not uh, anticipate me beginning, and that's with a poem. I came across this poem several years ago. It's titled Class Roster by Bonnie McNeen at the National Council for Teachers of English Convention. And the poem is about teaching community college, which is what I do primarily. And even if you do not teach at community college, I think it's a really important frame to keep in mind as we think about how we might use phones in the class and the reasons why we might choose to do so. So this poem begins, I'm going to take attendance. When I say your name, please let me know if I have mispronounced it. Maurice Benson, here. I work nights loading UPS trucks. After two paychecks, maybe three, I'll get my $125 textbook. Patricia Fitopoli, here. My little brother has cerebral palsy. Sometimes I cut class so I can take him to speech therapy. William Marshall, here. I read on a fifth grade level, but I have to attend college to keep my health insurance. Zoe Ostick, here. My parents kicked me out six weeks ago. Now I live in my boyfriend's basement. Sometimes we get high before class. Sonia Telmez, here. English is my second language. Please don't notice the mushroom compost underneath my fingernail. Rashid Unger, here. I just got back from Iraq. An IED blew my buddy's head off. Loud noises startle me. Lisa Wisniewski, here. My boyfriend dumped me yesterday. Wednesday and Friday, I will skip class to have an abortion. Please read the syllabus before the next semester. I'm looking forward to a great class. Bonnie McNeen. And in this poem, you know, McNeen is really trying to highlight for so many of us what the experience can be teaching community college, where our students, if you don't take the opportunity to get to know them beyond their names have these remarkable stories for how they got to our classroom, why they're here, and sometimes it's very easy to forget that among the sea of faces that we see in the room, that behind each face is this individual story. And 
I like to keep that in mind because sometimes with technology, uh, we tend to forget the importance of the stories of the people holding the devices. And I'm going to explain why this poem is so significant um, toward the end of the first part of my talk, but I want to have it in your minds as we move forward. So the case for BYOD, and BYOD is this really uh, fun term that the technology community has adopted to explain the process of bringing your own device to the classroom, meaning that a student has their own personal either cell phone, tablet, laptop, computer, e-reader that they bring with them into the classroom that they own, and they use the college's Wi-Fi connectivity and other um, electric, electrical resources to participate in the classroom experience. Um, one of the many challenges with BYOD can be that because it's not an institution uh, purchase, you're going to have students with all different types of devices, and many instructors are reluctant to allow them into the classroom because of management concerns. But what was interesting to me in the last few months, which you may or may not have seen, is there's been a resurgence in the press about this question of whether or not we should allow laptops in the classroom. So in thinking about laptop use as a bridge into mobile devices, there was this article that came out in the Scientific American in 20, uh, July of 2017, and it makes the argument, laptops are better off, students are better off without a laptop in the classroom, because what do you think they'll actually use it for? And it's based on a study titled Logged In and Zoned Out, How Laptop Internet Use Relates to Classroom Learning by Raviza Ogilvart and Fenn from Michigan State University. And this study follows students in a psychology class at Michigan State, and the students have to report how much they think the laptop use interferes with their uh, work in the classroom, and the researchers follow them to see how often they log on to the internet during a lecture and how often they're distracted during a lecture and also takes a look at what their scores are at the end. And the authors make the argument that laptop use is detrimental. And this quote from the methodology section reads, Data was collected via the proxy server over 15 lectures. Each lecture lasted one hour and 50 minutes with a 10-minute break in the middle. Now, the students were asked, you know, those participating in the study, that they had to log on to this server before the class started so that the researchers could follow all of their moves online. That's what the proxy server part refers to. But the part for me that was so compelling was this idea that they were sitting for 15 lectures for one hour and 50 minutes each. And it's not clear in the research whether or not that class met, uh, it was just meeting one time a week for an hour and 50 minutes, or it was multiple times, or they were just taking part of the semester. But for an hour and 50 minutes to stay focused on one particular task, and that being listening to a lecture, it's not surprising to me that students would be, you know, on the internet or the other places, and regardless of whether they had a laptop in front of them or not, uh, the capacity to pay attention continuously for that long, I think, is a challenge for many of us. Um, we see it too often ourselves when we're in a professional development that goes on for many, many hours, how often our, our ourselves and our colleagues, perhaps they're checking our phones or are somewhere other than being completely present in the moment. Um, so what was interesting to me about how this conversation emerged over the last few months is that then there was this op-ed in the New York Times uh, by Susan Darnowski, and she says, laptops are great, but not during a lecture or a meeting. And in, you know, her response, and there's this wonderful, you know, absolutely perfect cartoon from Peter Arkel that, that 
is also in the New York Times accompanying her article, and you see the professor's there, and he's lecturing, and he says, and what I, you just type whatever I say without even thinking, and there's everybody pretty much typing except the one student in the front row who's, you know, obviously on a video game or something else. And I think for so many of us, that's our, our fear with, with BYOD. And, you know, Darnarski says, you know, if students have disabilities, that's fine. They can use their laptops, but otherwise, it's a hindrance. And she says, the best evidence available now suggests that students should avoid laptops during lectures and just pick up their pens. It's not a leap to think that the same holds for middle and high school classrooms as well as for workplace meetings. And again, what's interesting to me is this focus on the lecture, that that's the reason that we need to put laptops and devices away is because it's distracting from the lecture. And this is not to discredit any of the very important research being done about the differences between taking notes by hand uh, versus on a laptop or a, a tablet, but the community conversation in academia too often seems to center around how additional devices detract from lectures rather than taking a moment to question whether or not lecturing is the most appropriate method for teaching our courses. And some of this is structural, right? We're assigned to lecture halls and we've got classes of, in, I would imagine, our university centers of upwards of 100 to maybe 500 students. I was an undergraduate at SUNY Binghamton. I took a psychology class that had 500 people in it. Um, but the devices are not about necessarily enhancing uh, lectures, and, and they can be used that way. But they're also this opportunity to do things other than lecture in the classroom. Uh, Mark Sample, who's a really brilliant mind in digital literacies uh, that you might want to follow his research. He posted in response to this New York Times article on his website, 10 things we did with laptops in class instead of banning them. And uh, Erin, I'll try to get that link for you, maybe to, to share it to others. Uh, it's on the, it's yep. in the bibliography I'll if grab it. are interested. And thanks so much. So he lists, you know, 10 really awesome projects that he did in his university classes that involved the use of, you know, uh, a laptop or a, a tablet or a mobile phone. And Kathy Ann Davidson, who you might be more familiar with, uh, you know, who's the co-founder of Haystack and the, uh, you know, director at the CUNY now for so many digital initiatives, she wrote a very pointed response, you know, 10 even more basic things we do with laptops in class instead of banning them. And she says quite eloquently, I neither require nor ban laptops. I never use any technology, including index cards and pencils or books or articles, without having students discuss the affordances of that particular technology. When I do use laptops in my classrooms, I make sure that it's for a purpose and that everyone in the class participates in that purpose. And I think that <coughs> cogent and sound advice for all of us who embark to use uh, bring your own devices, mobile phones, et cetera, in the classroom is that it's just another tool that we're using to meet our curricular goals and that it's a way to enhance participation among students rather than uh, limit it. And what we have to kind of think about in particular about mobile phones because the larger conversation in academia, you know, still seems to be centered on laptops, but particularly for those of us who teach at the community college level, and for those of us who do teach at the, you know, state college and state university center levels who are receiving large number of transfer students from community colleges, we have to see the interesting things that are emerging about the demographics for mobile phone ownership and use. We're at a point now, and these statistics are the most recent from the uh, Pew Research Center, and uh, the everything that I'm citing here is included in a bibliography at the end of the presentation if anything interests you and you want to find more information. 95% of all Americans own a cell phone of some kind, and 77% of them are smartphones. Now, we're moving toward this moment where Many of us have mobile devices, but what's interesting 
is what's happening with segments of our population that are typically thought to be disenfranchised. Because too often when we talk about uh, technology historically in the classroom, we talk about digital divide and this idea that some people have devices and some people don't. Um, where that is still somewhat true, the nuances of it are, are a bit different. Because what you'll see now is that 8 in 10 adults pretty much have a desktop or a laptop computer and that they also have a, a mobile device. But for our most disenfranchised students, many of them are what we call smartphone only. So today just over 1 in 10 American adults are smartphone only internet users, meaning they own a smartphone but do not have traditional home broadband service. So one, you know, one out of ten Americans are totally, you know, smartphone only, and they're, they're smartphone dependent, really, according to the Purdue Research Center, latest statistics from 2017. And who are these people who are smartphone dependent? They're people with less than a high school graduate, people who are just high school graduates or who have some college. Um, when you peel back the data, you start to see that the largest number of people who are smartphone dependent have the lower lower income. They are mostly people of, of color. And for many of us at the community college level, these are our students. They are smartphone dependent. So when you are giving an assignment, their access to the internet is going to be through their phones. Many of them don't necessarily know how to best use their phones. Um, our students can often be housing insecure, um, and although we have many, many resources on all of our campuses here to support students while they are on campus, for commuting students, they're making their schedules in these very tight uh, constraints because they're trying to accommodate their jobs and their outside family commitments. They're not on campus very long, and they're not on campus often long enough to spend time using those resources. I, with my own students in the classroom, I want to be able to make sure that um, students are empowered to do the assignments that I'm giving them on their own time with the devices that they have access to and to use these very powerful computers that most of them are holding in their pockets for something better than Snapchat. <laughs> and my argument for BYOD is that it's going to enhance non-lecture-based opportunities in the classroom, but that also is a necessity for a growing percentage of our students who are smartphone dependent. And that's not to say there aren't problems with the use of bring-your-own-device technologies in the classroom, or to say that it's even my preferred method. You know, if I had endless power over this situation, I would love for my students to be able to access um, uh, laptop or a tablet that was, you know, bought by the, the university on any day that they might need it at the, the whim that we might, the class takes a turn where we might be able to use them in the classroom. But that's, that's not the reality for all of us. So I think that being able to teach our students how to most effectively use their phones and for us to harness them in the classroom is going to make our students more successful in their out-of-class environments. It's a way to extend the walls of our classroom and keep the conversation moving after the course has ended. It's also a way for us as instructors to really see some of the ways that our students think that are influenced by their smartphone behavior. And as I had probably the, the best compliment and the best plug I've gotten ever for uh, BYOD phone use in the classroom, I had a student once tell me they had to turn off their push notifications for, you know, Snapchat and Instagram because they were too busy using their phone in class for class-related needs that the phone wasn't powerful enough to do both, so they had to prioritize their um, their coursework. And that's sort of the exciting moment is for me when students can understand that their phones harness this power for intellectual and academic capabilities and that they're going to choose to use them in this way.
so we're going to move on to best practices. I see there's some things going on in the chat. I haven't followed them, um, all of this. But is, Aaron, is there any reason to stop at this point before I move forward? Sure, we can. And they're not questions, just a little conversation. Um, oh. And I think this is a good point because it is relevant to what you just shared. Um, so I, I'll read it to you, and maybe you might want to comment on it. Um, but Kathleen is talking about how we need to ensure that students have the particular apps that we're requiring them to use on their phones um, to be able to use them in class. She's found that students are sometimes reticent about using these apps after that coolness factor wears off, right? And um, we got talking a little bit about um, maybe they could send the instructor something from the app so the instructor knows that, but somehow that there needs to be both in-class and out-of-class scaffolding to make that happen, right? A lot of students don't want to use computers to do their academic work. Um, there's just these interesting dynamics that keep happening. Absolutely, and I for, forgive me if I lost. The, is there is there a particular question nope. that I need to nope. respond to in there, or just a general consensus of the, the group? Yep, no particular question. Just um, that was the commentary that was happening. Oh, excellent! And I'm, I, that's one of the things that I love about um, this feature on collaborate that we can be able to have these moments where it's not just a lecture, right, that you're able to sort of turn and talk to somebody, but that there's a record of those conversations. Audrey, so exciting. Okay. I'm going to move on to best practices unless, Erin, you think there's a reason to pause here. No, I think that's great. Thank you. No problem. So some best practices. The idea, I think, for most people in allowing smartphone use in the classroom is something that's quite terrifying, and I don't blame you in the, the least, because I think that there are so many possible things that could go wrong. It, it, it's scary to even consider why we should let them into the classroom. But the reality is our students are carrying around these devices all day. You don't quite, you can't always quite be sure when they're using them and when they're not, if they're recording you and if they're not. Uh, you know, if they're involved in some type of activity that's unsavory among other students in your class that you, the instructor, aren't even part, a part of or aware of, these are all the material realities of teaching today, whether or not you invite the phones into the classroom or not. So I think taking the step to invite them in is actually also a classroom management technique because you're acknowledging to the students, I know you have these, I know you're going to be using them, so let's use them for productive means. And I think the first thing we need to do is establish clear guidelines for how and when personal devices will be used in class. We need to curate apps that will extend specific curricular experiences both within the class structure and beyond class time. And we need to solicit continuous feedback from students to ensure smooth interoperability and current software. I'm going to take a little time to go into each of these three um, main points, but if you're going to set up a bring your own device classroom, these are the three uh, places that you should focus your attention. So the first part about establishing uh, clear guidelines, you need to make sure that your syllabus is very clear. So you want to include a policy in your syllabus in regards to technological misuse. Uh, be sure to define technological misuse as it applies to your course. Uh, for example, I teach a reading workshop and our students have the opportunity to develop their own reading list. And where we are very fortunate to have a variety of uh, novels and current nonfiction and books that might, that are high interest, that might capture students' attention, we don't always necessarily have enough copies of a particular text that students want to read at any given time. And through both the uh, National Community College Library and also students' home libraries through the NASA library system, uh, they have access to a variety of ebooks that they can check out seamlessly on their on their phones. And I do encourage students to get the title on their reading list that they truly want to read. And that might involve reading an ebook. And for most of my students, if they're going to read an ebook, the only way to access that book is through their phone. So there will be times in class where students are reading independently. And students will have to take out their phones if they're reading an ebook to read independently. But part of my syllabus structure lets them know that there will be times when we're using phones in class for specific purposes, such as you know reading your ebook during class, 
and the expectation is that you're using the phone when you take it out for the described purpose. If you're not, uh, technological misuse counts as a late. And we have, you know, department policy and college-wide policies on lateness and on uh, overall attendance and how lateness counts toward attendance. And that holds students accountable for cell phone use in class. I think it's also really important to read aloud your campus policy on cyberbullying in the student code of hand, uh, the student code of conduct. This is something that I'm actually adding into my classroom for next semester because what I've found is that uh, once students realize that you're sort of tech savvy, they change their behaviors in your classroom in ways that they might not for other instructors. But the students, because they're performing well for you with their phone, doesn't necessarily mean that they are being the best student possible to others in the classroom, or the best, the best peer, I should say. So I think, you know, there was a text I read early on in my career called The Students Are Always Watching, and it was about teaching um, uh, younger, younger children, middle school and elementary school students, but I think it has relevance at all levels of teaching. And the idea is that the students are learning more from you on any given moment from your subtle gestures and actions than they are sometimes from the, the content of what you're saying. And I think taking a moment to, in class to acknowledge that students have a certain responsibility to one another as classmates because they will develop friendships over the course of the semester. And um, you want to make sure that they understand how to maintain those friendships in a positive manner in online spaces. Um, and that's something that I'm going to bring into my next semester class. And also that you want to model the behaviors you expect of your students in all professional settings. And I think actually this is the hardest for me personally, but I think for many of us. Um, if you would be very angry and upset if your students took out their phone and were, were texting while you were talking, we can't do it during a faculty meeting, and we can't do it during a professional development. And that's, even though our students might not be in the room when those spaces are happening, if, if we can live by the rules we set in our classroom and other spaces, then we know those rules are effective. If we can't live by the rules we set up in our classroom and other spaces, then we need to adapt the rules we have in our, our classroom. Um, because that keeps us kind of current and connected with the realities that our, our students are facing. And it also creates a, a classroom environment with authentic expectations. Um, this part is, is really key, I think, for maintaining a program that's going to be effective in the long run. Because these devices are not going away. They're just going to continue to morph and transform. And we have to uh, continue to keep pace with emerging technologies. Um, so you want to ask these, these are questions you can specifically ask your students either, you know, in a free ride or in a casual conversation, but, you know, how does the user experience differ when toggling between a computer and a mobile device for, you know, whatever app or whatever program you're using in class? Because what you really want are um, a smooth sort of trans-languaging experience between using the desktop computer and using a phone. So I know on my campus, if I'm going to show a website or a particular application, the way that I'm going to do it is a projector hooked up to a desktop computer or a laptop computer in that classroom. If I'm using an app for class that only runs on mobile, I won't be able to demonstrate to the room. So I have to find things that are, you know, applications that are device agnostic, that move across a variety of devices seamlessly. And sometimes there are snags in that that we don't know as instructors because all of our students have different devices. So you want to ask this question about what's, what's different in your experience using this app on a computer versus a mobile device. You want to ask what are the differences in experience between iOS and Android users. For the most part, your class is going to be divided into uh, iOS, which are Apple, Apple products, and uh, Android users. And some things that typically work well for you or might seem to work well for you if you practice before class time might not work as well with your students because they have different um, operating systems. And you want to kind of catch where those snags are. And the question you want to ask your students 
that is less about what's going on with you in your particular class, but as an institution as a whole, how can our campus best support personal devices? And they'll give you some pretty good uh, feedback, I think, about how the campus could help them. And then when you sit on various committees on your campus or connect with colleagues who do sit on those appropriate committees, you can spread that information forward. Uh, so I'm actually going to stay on the slide for a moment. I think that uh, students have said to me over the years, you know, some of the issues are you know, there aren't enough places on campus to charge their phones. Um, there isn't a, a place on campus where if they have a hardware issue, you know, they have a cracked screen, et cetera, that they could easily uh, get those issues remedied on campus. And, you know, those things are all beyond my um, level of control, but I can still take their findings and pass them on to the appropriate party. So in terms of curating, you know, apps, like what apps are good to use in the, the classroom, I'm going to share with you some apps that I've had tremendous success with and talk about some of the ways that I, I use them and ways that people across disciplines can use them. The first app that I think is extraordinarily important is the Remind app. Um, Remind gives you a couple of options. It's both a two-way and a one-way classroom alert system, but I only use it as a one-way alert system, and I would actually caution you to also use it as a one-way alert system. In the same way that on your home campus, you might get a text message that says something like, you know, school is closed today due to a storm, and they give you maybe some information about uh, when classes may start again. That's a one-way alert system. You don't then text your college back and say, thank you so much for letting me know that there's going to be snow today. Um, Remind works like that, but for your own classroom. You can go to, you know, remind.com, it's on the slide, and set up a free account. And what it does is it gives you access both on a desktop and on a mobile phone to send messages to your students. They do not have your phone number. You do not have their phone number. Uh, the students, it's very... It's actually quite user-friendly. Once you set up an account, they give you a code, your students text that code, and they're already enrolled in this messaging program. So you can use it for things like, you know, um, you have to cancel class for some reason, or the class is going to need a different room. Those are all appropriate uses of it. But I also use it to send my students hot links during class. Um, you know, I do a lot with trying to make my classroom materials as open access as possible. So um, I might send them a link to an assignment we're working on in class, a, a reading that I found just that morning that I think is incredibly important. I want them to be able to read in class. And having that one-way ability to send a link to my students uh, really changes the shape of what we can do in any given class period. Uh, Padlet is another amazing app because it allows you to have an interactive uh, board immediately. So if you've got a smart board or you have a, you know, even just a whiteboard with a projector, creating a Padlet account puts together a blank board and you can send to your students a link, which I would do through Remind, send them a link to the Padlet board, and they can add information to the board from their, their seats. You know, this little board here had to do with character playlists, like, you know, if you were a character in a particular story, what? What would be a song on your playlist, explain why. And the students could do a little writing, and that writing can be by hand, or it could be on their phone, you know, it's up to you, whatever the contours of what you want to have happen in the class. But then they copy it into their, uh, copy it, they copy whatever they've written in, onto the Padlet, and they post it, and they can post the link to a video or to um, lyrics to a song, and now I have all of those arranged on the smart board, and we can talk about them. We can visit them. Students can visit them on their own smaller screens. And it's this collaborative interactive bulletin board that allows your students to immediately share resources with the class as a whole. Um, so that, again, like the Remind, they can work with, with some interoperability. Uh, they can be standalone, but they're not content-driven apps, They're, the reason I'm sharing them is because they enhance certain classroom processes. 
And we love Google Docs for, I, I shouldn't assume that I know, I love Google Docs. Many of us, you know, have found it this revolutionary way to collaborate with one another. Um, Google Docs allows us writing and work, workshopping across devices and, and spaces that I think, especially as an instructor of writing, this is the number one place where I'm using um, mobile phones in the classroom. So it, it, you can use the Google Docs for, you know, a very, uh, a very sophisticated in-class peer review of a particular um, piece of writing. Uh, your students also, if you're workshopping with them individually, they can pull up their essays on their phone. You can give them comments, show them certain things, and then they can go back later and work on it. Um, but also that it's got such seamless integration across devices that you can be on a desktop or a mobile phone and not have, um, uh, well, for the most part, I haven't had any problems with students, uh, no matter what device or platform they're using, being able to access their writing and to be able to get in very close and fine, finely tune their craft. And I think what is particularly exciting about Google Docs is that for so many of our students, they get kind of, especially I'll have freshmen and they'll have gotten a laptop, for example, and they don't realize that uh, it doesn't have Microsoft Word on it. And, you know, many of our campuses allow a student download of Microsoft Word, but they don't necessarily take advantage of that. Uh, the Google Docs takes a lot of the financial barrier away from the composition process, but also gives them the opportunity to work in spaces where if they were to whip out a traditional laptop, they might not be empowered to do so. Uh, students who have jobs where it's not socially acceptable, perhaps, to take out your laptop and do a little work on your break, but you can be on your phone, and that's socially acceptable. So if you're going to be on your phone anyway, you might as well be writing a paper for class. I mean, there are problems, of course, with all of these things because, you know, when you're composing on a smaller screen, students have to get used to that, something that looks quite mammoth when they then go to uh, print it or they look at it on a larger desktop, they realize maybe they haven't written quite as much as they thought they did. Um, but those are, those are sort of rookie mistakes that they might make once and then they, they learn and they adapt and they move on. But wouldn't hinder me from using uh, a phone with students in the class. In terms of uh, scaling mobile use, Erin, should I move on to scaling mobile use, or you're keeping track of the time? Yes, you're, you're doing great. You can go ahead. OK, great. So in terms of scaling mobile use, there are really five things that I think institutions as a whole uh, can keep in mind if this is something they want to pursue to be able to uh, allow students to use their phones more frequently on campus. Our students are on campus for uh, many, many hours, those of us who work on commuter campuses, and there needs to be increased access to charging stations. Uh, particularly if students are going to be using their phones in multiple classes, they're going to wear the battery down. And we've seen also recently all the studies about you know, with Apple, with Apple products, to how the batteries are, are dying and, uh, more frequently than they were in the, the past due to some system upgrades, so that the charging is imperative. Our students need access to strong wireless networks. Uh, you know, there are often, there's often a cap on how many people can be on a public Wi-Fi at any given time, so if we are uh, inviting students to use their own personal devices as part of the uh, classroom experience that's going to put uh, undue stress, perhaps, on the wireless network. We want to continue to invest in OER resources for our students. Um, and the way they're going to be accessing those OER resources quite often through their, their phones. So um, having that structure in having mobile phone support in place is actually going to, I think, empower and catalyst the movement toward OER. Uh, we want to continuously solicit feedback from instructors and students on how it's going and where the problems are and how we can troubleshoot those problems. For uh, many of us, in, you know, at SUNY, we're really excited that uh, MTech MOOC, the beta, is launching this week. And 
the official launch is coming up in March, and I believe Erin's going to share a link for those of you who might be interested. Uh, MTech, the Emerging Technologies MOOC, is SUNY's first massive open online course, and it's going to be administered through the Coursera platform. It is available for students, instructors, and uh, professors and staff together who want to stay current with all of the many uh, apps and experiences that are available through technology for our students um, and for our learning and research and teaching needs. But it's, you know, it's often very daunting to kind of stay a lifelong learner and to access all of these materials and figure out the time to, it takes to, to learn how to use particular apps. You know, I only gave you three general apps that can be used across disciplines here. But the reason I didn't go in depth into any particular application is because in this webinar format, I don't necessarily know that it's the best environment to uh, learn about how to use any one particular feature. Whereas if you decide that you want to learn more about which apps to curate for your classroom, I strongly suggest you join the MTech MOOC. And it's, it's free if you work for SUNY. And you enroll in this about uh, a uh, four, uh, four to five week uh, course through Coursera. But it's, it's not a course in the sense that you have to worry about completing it. If you can't complete it, you can't complete it. That's not a problem. But what it does is it introduces you to so many different emerging technology tools that are free for you to use in the classroom, gives you the opportunity to tinker around and play with them, uh, to build a network among other faculty across all, I think it's, what is it, Aaron, 76 SUNY campuses? Um, 64. The entire, how many? 64? 64. Yep. Okay, so across 64 SUNY campuses and make connections, both personal and professional, to help you, you know, explore these new technologies. What I found in my own career is that having other, um, you know, a professional learning network of peers to kind of support you and to challenge you and to inspire you, that's what keeps you uh, current. And I really strongly suggest that you take a look at the MTech MOOC, maybe consider joining it if you think you want to start to bring more uh, BYOD into the classroom. So the last small thing, and I guess it's not small, it's the most important thing, right, is I have a bibliography at the end of the presentation. So if any uh, article or anything I mentioned is of interest to you, you can find the URL there. Um, so Erin, I want to see if there are other there are questions or comments or anything that people want to talk about in the remaining time. Yeah, there's, there's been some great discussion um, in the chat about what other folks who are on the call are, are doing in their classes, some other tools that they're using. Um, some things that were mentioned that you might be aware of are um, Ziggy, which is a mobile doc camera, Pico for projection, um, Pear Deck to use instead of Google Slides, Socrative, Quizzes, Quizlet. Um, Gabriella did ask if you had any suggestions for apps for doing quizzes with students, and so that's where some of that came from. I don't know if you have any to add. Yeah, have you talked to, have you, has anybody mentioned Kahoot? Oh, no, I haven't seen Kahoot yet. So it's, it's spelled like this, Kahoot. Um, I, I can try to find, or if you don't mind. Uh, oh, they Aaron, did, okay, I must have missed it. Yep. Yeah, I think Kahoot, our, one thing that I think is great about Kahoot is that our students have used it at the high school level, so they're already familiar oftentimes with how it works. You as an instructor might have to learn, and, and it's a pretty uh, user-friendly site, but the other thing that I like about those quiz apps, and I would encourage you to consider in your own classroom, is having your students build and design their own quizzes that then you use with them. And having your students sort of think like the test maker rather than the test taker, uh, that can create uh, some excitement in the classroom and also get them thinking structurally about key components of your course. Now, the other thing that has um, come up, too, is how people are, are using this and sharing kind of how they approach the, the, um, the policies and 
um, the consequences kind of, you know, um, piece of the syllabus. And I think your point about making sure that it's in the syllabus is really um, important. If you have something there to point back to that is, um, you know, the syllabus is the contract for the course. And also, I think it was Kathleen talked about maybe creating that contract together with the students, too, for how we will use devices in the classroom. So some great conversation around that as well. Absolutely. And I think, um, you know, for those of you who really want to talk more about tools, the MTech MOOC has an accompanying MTech wiki. And the wiki there has these crowdsourced tech tools that have emerged from the last uh, three or four years of the SUNY Tools of Engagement Project. Some of you may have been involved in SUNY TOEFL, and it was the um, the online community uh, that was, I think, it was hosted on Google Plus for many years, where people from across many campuses could come together and share what they were doing in their classrooms and, and learn about, you know, how to use tools for presentations or for photo sharing, et cetera. And after doing that process for many years, the same, you know, the same sort of tools kept coming up and there had been a consensus of which ones worked better for which um, practical purposes. And the MTech wiki evolved from that. And, it, and as a wiki, you know, it's a flexible interface and new tools will be added all the time. So I think even if you don't have the time to commit to a full Coursera course, just signing up for MTech MOOC gives you the access to the MTech wiki. And you can use that as a repository for the different apps you might want to use in the classroom, depending on your specific purposes. Yeah, that's great. And I put a link for that, all that information in the chat. Um, there was another question. We were talking about the, um, the policies issue. And Kathleen was asking, besides attendance as a stick and carrot that you use, does, do you have any other recommendations for infractions to the policy? Absolutely. I think, and this kind of cycles back to the poem, too, in the beginning, this idea of trying to know your students and who they are and where they're coming from and establishing, you know, as best you can, because some of us teach, do teach very, very large classes, relationships with your students makes it easier, I think, and gives you more credibility as an instructor when you say to somebody, what you're doing is inappropriate, why are you doing that? what's going on, because sometimes what you'll find out is that what appears as very inappropriate behavior is rooted in a very real concern or a very real problem your student is having, and being able to redirect them to the resources either on campus or off campus that are going to help them with that problem is uh, crucial. Uh, that, and I know, again, some of us do teach on campuses with huge course numbers, and that might be impossible. but. Being able to kind of discern where that behavior stems from and what's going on often can um, prevent much of what, what's happening. Uh, in terms of like other hard-nosed, you know, classroom policies, it's for me this continual work in progress because I think certain behaviors, my tolerance for certain behaviors shifts depending on the, the context and the, and the situation. But the idea of even just stopping class sometimes and saying, like, hey, we're, we seem to have an issue with this type of technological misuse. Where is that coming from? What's happening? And you know, students can sometimes give you feedback that uh, is hard to swallow, but is important about maybe where they're lost or why they're confused or what, what seems to be the moment that they check out. The earlier study, I'm um, just going to put the slides back real quick uh, here from the very, very beginning of the talk about laptop use and why students are zoning out. Uh, there's a lot of time spent on this notion, and they don't go into the, the qualitative data of this so much, but that students become bored and then they, they, they toggle out. But that boredom sometimes I think is, it isn't just math by, I don't, I don't find this interesting. It's that there's something in the delivery method or the, the approach that students feel like they cannot perform or they can't engage, and then they tune out. So trying to figure out how we can alter the shape of what's happening in the classroom to keep them engaged.
Thank you very uh, much. I, this is more going on in the chat. I'm just trying to catch up. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, people are agreeing with you in general there. <laughs> okay. And, you know, I, I think that the, the Davidson piece for me is really key. It's just this idea that we don't, you know, we're not going to ban devices, but we're going to use them in productive ways. And there's actually, I didn't mention this in the talk, but there's a reading I do with my students about Steve Jobs and it's uh, a newspaper article that says uh, Steve Jobs was a low-tech parent. And the uh, interviewer who uh, had a chance to talk with Steve Jobs right when the iPad first came out said, oh, your, your children must love this device. And he says, no, my, my children don't use it. You know, we don't, we don't allow iPads in the house, and my children read a lot of books, and there are no devices at the table. And, and the researcher was kind of shocked and then went out to all these different big tech companies and asked them what they do with their own kids and was shocked to find out that um, device use wasn't as prevalent as the researcher had imagined. And, but when you start to peel back what they're doing with the devices, it's, it's not that nobody, nobody has a flat out ban. It's just we're going to um, use these technologies for specific times and specific purposes. We're going to use them for creative, creativity, um, for uh, opportunities to do things we couldn't otherwise do um, in years before their existence. But that the devices themselves are not, not the, the primary. They're just an extension of, you know, critical thinking, great, great conversation, um, great collaboration and community. They're, they're just an accessory to that because that's really the central component of any uh, strong classroom environment, any strong uh, um, uh, professional community. So I'm excited that some of you uh, are considering maybe using devices who weren't before and that others of you who are using them are continuing to uh, influence your colleagues to know that just because you allow phones in the classroom doesn't mean you also allow chaos in the classroom, that there is a structured way to bring them in. Yeah, absolutely. That's a good point. Um, and just in the interest of time, I'll, I'll give some wrap-up. I know some folks have expressed that they had to go. Um, oh, the graphic on that is a little wonky. But I just want to thank you, uh, Gina, for sharing with us today. We appreciate your leadership and your willingness to represent Open SUNY in the community and what you're doing. We also recognize there may be others in the community, or you may know of someone who's doing something that you think would make a great webinar. So I'm going to put a link in the chat to submit a proposal if that's something you're interested in. And feel free to share that um, with your colleagues. Today's session was recorded, and we will make that recording and the slides available to you on the same page where you registered, which I'll put that in the chat here as well, that bit.ly goes right to the registration page. So that will be updated. Instead of having a registration link, it will have the resources for this chat. Um, if you're interested in any past fellow chats and wonder what other people have shared about, we do have a, a blog page where those are listed. And you can take a look at past fellow chats. So we thank you for your time, attention, and great conversation today. And we look forward to seeing you at another virtual event soon. Take care, thank everyone. Thank you so much, Aaron. Thank you, everyone.